Good afternoon and welcome to our last installment of the SP2 Speaker Series for this semester. Um, we have the exciting opportunity to um, uh, hear from uh, Professor Ioana Marinescu. I'm still catching my breath, so forgive me. <laughs> I literally ran from 30 to 15 minutes ago. Um, so Ioana Marinescu is an economist who studies the labor market to craft policies that can enhance employment, productivity, and economic security. To make an informed policy decision, um, it is crucial to determine the costs and be benefits of policies. Dr. Marinescu's research expertise includes online job search, workforce development, unemployment insurance, the universal basic income, and employment contracts. And also, I have to say, one fun fact about Joanna that I learned when we were recruiting her last year um, was in our, what, 45 minutes, hour long conversation <laughs> over the phone, um, Joanna is a salsa dancer and enjoys salsa dancing. <laughs> and as as a as a boutique for myself, tell them my <laughs> <laughs> I was really excited. She, she just she already was strung, uh, singing my, my praises already. <laughs> Anyways, so did you go dance together? Not, not oh, yet. Yes. Yeah, it's in the works. <laughs> So anyways, today we have the privilege and honor to um, uh, hear you want to give us a lecture on universal basic income, jobs, and politics. Awesome. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Um, so I'm really excited to talk to you about this topic. And before I begin, I'd like to invite you to ask questions as we go uh, and make comments as we go rather than uh, holding them for the end because that will make for a more interactive uh, presentation. I want to make sure to address your questions and concerns uh, as we go on. So um, this is a presentation that is going to cover two of my uh, projects, one that is really in its um, early stages, uh, and then another one that is essentially done. Um, and so I want to talk about uh, both of them uh, with you. So what is a universal basic income? Just for starts, let's make sure we're all on the same page uh, with respect to what we're talking about. So universal basic income is an unconditional cash transfer to everyone uh, in a geographic or political uh, territory on a regular or long-term basis. Uh, currently, there is renewed interest in this policy. Uh, for example, Barack Obama said that given advances, advances in uh, artificial intelligence, many jobs will disappear and at the same time will get wealthier. So the universal basic income should be considered as part of a new uh, social compact. Well, Hillary Clinton actually took that quite seriously and she considered having an Alaska style universal basic income. We'll talk more today about Alaska as a campaign proposal in the end, it didn't make it uh, to the platform, but she considered it, which shows you, you know, the level of interest for this policy. Also, uh, French presidential, uh, presidential candidate Benoit Hamon, who was from the mainstream left, uh, had a universal basic income as a key campaign proposal uh, as well. So this was actually official. And currently, uh, on the ground, there are experiments running uh, in Finland and in Canada, in Ontario, and also in other places around the world. Uh, in, at the state level in the US, there is also action. For example, there's been a recent state bill in Hawaii uh, that establishes a commission to examine a universal basic income for Hawaii. Uh, and I personally was invited to testify about the universal basic income at the House of Pennsylvania, a Democratic Policy Committee on uh, November 29, which is a week ago, and my, some of my students uh, even made the trek there. Thank you guys for supporting me. Uh, so this was a very uh, interesting hearing where I got to talk about this policy to Pennsylvania legislators. So let's talk first a little bit about the politics of the basic income. So one objection to a universal basic income is that it will stop people from working because, hey, if you got all this money, for nothing, why should you go work? Uh, however, uh, as I will document more later on, research finds that there is little to no effect on work from having such a policy. Another common objection to a universal basic income is that it will increase spending on dr drugs and alcohol. Uh, but the research does not support this claim. And if you want to learn more about 
all this research around the effects of universal basic income style policies that have been tried in the US and elsewhere around the world, you can read my review of the literature, uh, which is on my website, uh, marinesco.eu. And so, you know, it, that, those are like objections that you might hear from many people, but let's talk a little bit about how this fits into a specific political context, looking at the left and the right. So from the left, why might you be interested in this if you're you know, one of the uh, left-leaning politicians, let's say? It can be a way to address poverty while sidestepping the poor political support for welfare, means-tested welfare programs like Medicaid. These programs often get a bad rap, uh, you know, and so there is the image of the undeserving poor receiving welfare. And because this program is a universal program, it is not targeted to anyone in particular, it can be a way to put cash into the pockets of poor people without having the stigma that is associated with, uh, with welfare. On the right, there are also supporters for universal basic income, and the arguments there revolve around the idea of individual choice and freedom, because this is a cash benefit that doesn't have any conditions. So it leaves the individual free to make whatever choices they think are best for them. And uh, furthermore, because there are no conditions, it is a much more efficient delivery of services. Since you don't need to screen people, look at what they're doing and what not, it's much easier to deliver this service and can save money in terms of you know, uh, sparing us the bureaucracy uh, of administering the system. And uh, be because of that, uh, from a you know, right perspective, you, a universal basic income can sidestep concerns about the low trust in institutions. So many people, and not only on the right, by the way, but perhaps more on the right, have uh, no low trust in government and local institutions. So the fact that a universal basic income is this simple policy where we're just giving cash to people can alleviate concerns about how well uh, local institutions or federal institutions are able to implement uh, complicated programs. So that uh, can be an asset from a more conservative perspective. So this all sounds great, but can this really work? Well, yeah, it sounds like it's bipartisan, but there are some serious wrinkles to this. Uh, so on the progressive side, one problem is that progressives fear that a universal basic income will lead us to gutting other programs eventually. So you know, if there was something like that, then maybe the conservatives would say, well, let's get rid of Medicaid. And many progressives don't see that you know, with a good eye. So therefore, they're afraid that this is going to be a pretext you know, to get rid of other programs that they think uh, are programs worth having. And it's almost the flip side for the conservatives they fear that a universal basic income will be layered on top of everything we already have. And therefore, if you're going to add yet another program, that means more taxes, more public spending, which is something that conservatives see you know, with an unfavorable eye. So it is not uh, easy to get those two parties to agree, because they essentially have you know, opposite fears with respect to how this program would interact uh, with other programs. Is this an add-on or is this something that could lead to cutting uh, other programs? So um, how, you know, what is the, because, you know, there is some bipartisan support, nevertheless, as I just explained, it is not completely obvious that this can work. So let's th think through realistically, you know, could we get any program like that to be implemented uh, in the U.S.? So. At the national level, a universal basic income or, or something like it is unlikely to pass given the gridlock. You know, you know, it's very hard to pass anything at the national uh, level. However, at the state level, one promising policy solution that could uh, finance a universal basic income is the so-called carbon fee and rebate, also called carbon tax and dividend, uh, which could be done at the state level. So for example, Washington, D.C. has a campaign called put a price on it, all right? So <laughs> the carbon, right? Uh, so uh, so that's, uh, that's what, uh, what this is about. So the idea, let me tell you, you know, how, uh, how this works. Uh, the carbon fee is the idea of, you know, you make the polluters pay in order to protect our children's future. And 
By the way, this idea of carbon fee or carbon tax is definitely a bipartisan idea at the level of economists. So both conservative and liberal economists agree that it's a great idea to have a carbon tax just so. And then you can use, and that's where the basic income comes in, you can use the revenue from this tax in order to finance uh, a basic income. So you, know, you rebate the revenue in the form of cash to the people, and that is the basis for a small you know, universal basic income. I'm saying small because the kinds of carbon tax that are being currently discussed will, would uh, allow for maybe $100 a month or so, which is not huge, but it is something. And so it's, it, it's a useful starting point to think about. And uh, you know, this, uh, furthermore, this policy is actually redistributive. So even though everyone would get the same amount, you have to keep in mind that we are implicitly paying taxes. It's this carbon tax. So as it <coughs> turns out, higher income people, uh, you know, as I said, they receive the same rebate. So that's not where the redistribution happens. But they bear a higher carbon tax burden. Because basically, just think about it. Higher income people have SUVs, Mac mansions. Uh, they travel the skies of the world. And that means they use a lot of carbon, therefore bearing you know, a higher uh, tax ultimately on their lifestyle than uh, lower income people would. And as a result, uh, the policy is uh, redistributive. So basically, this is a promising policy because it can achieve two things with one policy, you know, fight uh, pollution and global warming, and uh, provide cash income uh, to all. So um, as, uh, as it happens, as I have new research coming up about this specific option in terms of policy, the carbon tax and dividend, or carbon fee and uh, rebate. But before I go there, I want to just briefly pause to ask if you guys have any question or comment. <coughs> yes? What's the range of um, sort of proposals or suggestions for the size of the UDI? So, so I know that there are these various places. Uh, uh, yeah, so there is a broad uh, range of sizes. I, I mentioned this carbon uh, tax would provide a small uh, UBI of 100 or maybe even less, uh, a little bit less per month, but some, somewhere in that, uh, in that ballpark. Uh, and uh, you, you have then uh, proposals that could be as high as you know, $10,000 uh, per year, so closer to the poverty line. There are various proposals, but with such a high UBI, it becomes an issue of how this can be financed. And then we are back into this you know, partisan thing where the conservatives will say, well, how are you going to find such a big UBI? I'm not going to agree to, you know, increase taxes this much. And then the pro progressives will say, well, I don't want to cut any other program. So it is a difficult proposition to go straight to a high level of UBI because of, you know, the difficulty of either raising funds or cutting programs to such a degree that it liberates enough uh, funds uh, to finance this level of, uh, of UBI. Yes? Um, I, I was curious about this last claim that um, higher income people receive uh, or uh, bear higher carbon tax burden. Right. Because it would seem to me as a percent of income that lower income people um, may also have a, a, a high carbon tax burden because they're taking the bus, they're driving cars, they're doing everything like that. And yet have a smaller income. Right. So, so this is something that is not necessarily obvious from theory. But it, you know, uh, serious studies have been done looking at actually what people consume. And on average, uh, you know, there is no question that high income people would bear more of the burden. Now, keep in mind there's variation. So some low income people, say, who live in rural areas could still uh, bear a significant task. But on average, you know, uh, it's really skewed towards higher income people as on average. Of uh, as absolute values. As absolute values. Right. But, but remember that the rebate is also absolute values. Yeah, yeah. So if you think that's where the redistributive comes in, that net, if you look at how much you're paying in taxes versus the rebate, on average, a poor person would receive a bigger net benefit than a rich person. That's what I mean with redistributive. So it's not in percent, but in terms of how much they'd be getting on net after you account for how much they're paying in taxes, poorer people would be getting more than uh, richer people. 
That's, that's what I meant. Not as a percent, but as a, you know, <laughs> amount of dollars. That's helpful. Thank you. Thanks. Um, OK, anything else? All right. So as I said, uh, I'm interested in this policy. In fact, a number of states, uh, I just read a, a, an article from the MIT Sloan Review, a number of states are considering these kinds of policies, including uh, prominently Massachusetts and Washington State. Washington State actually already had a policy like this being proposed before that failed, but you know there's enough wind behind it that it's going to come back on the agenda in the coming uh, in the coming year. So uh, we have an opinion survey, a national opinion survey, with my co-author Boris Shaw, who's a political scientist. That's going. To, it's expected to go live uh, in the winter. We're putting the last uh, touches to the survey currently. And the survey is a national <laughs> survey, and it will assess the support for a carbon tax and dividend at the state level, so state by state, but even at the legislative district level. Uh, and uh, using a, a technique that Boris uh, was involved in developing called the multi-level regression with post-certification. But basically what this does is, even if you don't have a huge sample, you can still make inferences about pretty small area like the electoral district. And so um, why is this important? Because if, for example, a, a policy like this were passed through a state house vote, just like the state of Pennsylvania to whom I've just been talking, it's important for representatives to know in your districts, you know, your constituents, how do they view uh, this policy? So you know, that's, that's important uh, information to have. So this is, of course, what people answer in a survey. So you never know if they would vote the same thing. So in order to connect survey answers with real world behavior, we will draw on the 2016 referendum results uh, about the similar policy of carbon tax and dividend that was done in Washington state. They lost with 60% no, 40% yes. So it's still you know, uh, something that, as I said, is going to come back uh, next year. So you know, like the Phoenix uh, being revived <laughs> from its ashes. So I want to contribute to this by you know, knowing more about how people think about this, uh, this issue. So what we're going to do, when, one second, I'll get back to you in a second, is that we're going to um, calibrate our survey to the actual uh, policy initiative. So we're going to ask the same question that was already put to the referendum in Washington, which is a real voting question. And then we have real voting data. And we can compare what our survey says versus the votes, again, in order to kind of calibrate our survey and see how it relates to real world behavior, which again could be slightly different uh, from what you see in a survey. Uh, and so before we go to what we learn, Bobby. Yeah, no, I'm sorry. But, um, so it's super interesting, the process. Do you consider Washington State an outlier because of its you know, no income tax and you know, it has you know, really unusual tax policies? So Washington state uh, might be an outlier. Obviously, states who start this are selected in some way because there is support in those areas. I think mostly they are selected on progressive, you know, Washington state and Massachusetts. So Massachusetts is the first state that uh, established a program of health insurance right. similar to the ACA. And actually, I think that's a great reason to bring it up because the program that was similar to the ACA that was in Massachusetts then became the blueprint for the ACA at the national level. So even though these states might not be your typical state, if they are able to successfully implement a policy that is well liked uh, by their constituents, this can serve as a blueprint for further uh, political developments at the national level. Um, so OK, so what uh, do we hope to learn from this uh, survey? And here, by the way, I'm also a little bit angling for feedback in what do you think is most interesting or what, what might you uh, ask be beyond what we're <laughs> thinking about asking. So first of all, and most obviously, we want to learn which states and which electoral districts are more supportive of this carbon tax and dividend. Uh, secondly, and remember, I come at this from the universal basic income side. It's just that I heard of this policy and I thought to myself, huh, this is interesting. This could be a vehicle for universal basic income. So to me, one interesting question is to ask, does pointing out that the carbon tax and dividend provides a universal basic income increase or decrease the support for the policy? Because obviously, this policy is going to be seen mainly as a climate policy. 
but does it help to say, hey, this is like a universal basic income, or would that rather hurt the interest of uh, passing the policy? So that's something that we can learn uh, from our survey. Uh, and then we also want to know what drives support and opposition uh, for uh, carbon tax and dividend or universal uh, basic income. And in particular, one interesting aspect of our survey is that we'll be able to talk about ideology. So which people with what kind of ideology embrace a universal basic income? As I was explaining earlier, there are some aspects of it that are more liberal in the classic sense and some aspects of it are more progressive. So what we'll be able to do is we're going to measure ideolo the ideology of each respondent on a scale that was developed by my co-author Boris Short to me measure the ideology of legislators. So he has detailed data on every legislator in the country at the state level, so including Pennsylvania, and he has measured you know, a kind of left-right scale where they stand. And let me tell you an interesting um, anecdote that when I, I was at the House of Pennsylvania committee hearing, my co-author was able to tell me exactly, you know, the people <laughs> I was going to talk to, where they were standing <laughs> on the ideological spectrum, which was a pretty neat, uh, you know, inside information to have. I'll let you guess where that was. <laughs> so, <laughs> so um, okay, so, so, and so therefore, we can also, this can also allow us to extrapolate potentially the support from the people that were surveying to legislators by, you know, if you were able to assume that someone, some legislator who shares the same ideology would respond in the same way as our survey respondents, then you can say something about likely support uh, among uh, legislators. We even thought of serving legislators, but they've been over, over surveyed, so we, can't, we wouldn't be able to get a high uh, response rate. Um, and uh, also, a broader question in the literature of political economy is support for redistribution. So there is a kind of enigma in this country in that inequality has been going up, but support for redistribution has been going down. So fitting into that, uh, we want to know to what extent people who support redistribution are more likely to support or not support either the universal basic income or uh, the carbon tax and, uh, and dividend. And, you know, it's not clear that if you're a strong supporter of redistribution, you necessarily support the basic income because, as I was explaining earlier, this is the same for everyone. So, it may, you know, you might think that it would be better to target your money much more uh, towards the poor in priorities. So it could be, you know, we don't know exactly how this correlates with your attitude towards uh, redistribution. Yeah. Is there any consideration to the way in which you're characterizing the carbon tax? Because I'm wondering if, if people hear tax, they automatically start thinking like, oh, I'm not going to support this. Yes. Versus if you characterize it in a different fashion, which effectively describes it as a tax, but doesn't use that language. Yes. That's a great question, and that's why currently we are thinking of using the language from the Washington uh, DC campaign, the carbon fee and rebate, uh, because that's something that you know, they thought about, obviously, before doing their campaign, and so we're going to use that. But then we're also going to use the actual referendum question in Washington state, which I think talks about a tax, but you know, this way it will allow us a little bit to compare how uh, people uh, react there. But that's, of, of course, an excellent point. Obviously. People's answers depend on what exactly you're asking about <laughs> and what this brings to mind you know, when, uh, when they answer the, uh, the question. Uh, and so therefore, thanks to uh, our results, we will be able to give some prediction uh, for any hypothetical you know, state level carbon fee and rebate of that sort that could be uh, potentially passed and therefore give an idea of where we stand in the progress towards such policies how realistic is it in different states uh, around the, uh, the country. So these kinds of lessons, for example, will be useful for policy actors like the Cit Citizens Climate Lobby, uh, which is a bipartisan uh, group of citizens who lobby for this carbon uh, fee and dividend. And so you know, knowing where there is already enough support could help them direct their efforts towards uh, states that are more amenable uh, to this kind of policy. And you know, the further details about who supports and so on can also help them uh, sharpen their message. 
in a way that perhaps is particular to that state. Because since we get state level data, people's reasons for opposing or supporting could be slightly different across states. Mm -hmm. So that's the beauty of us getting estimates state by state is that not only you can say, okay, the here people really support it, but why is it that they support it? And those in this same state who oppose it, what are their particular reasons for opposing it? So that can you know, really inform a strategic campaign in a given state in order to get something like that uh, passed. <laughs> So, um, all right, any other question about uh, this? Yes, Mark. So, how big is your sample going to be? So, the sample is going to be about 3,000 uh, uh, respondents uh, at the national level. And then you can use, like, demographics to try to predict. E exactly, demographics and answers to this battery of ideological questions, which will be actually quite <laughs> informative about what they're likely to, uh, to say. Um, any other question? All right. So, okay, so next up, so that's one of my projects that I'm really excited to, you know, and when I, today when I just read that many states are thinking or already have some law in preparations to pass this next year, I thought to myself, boy, we should really get this survey going now, <laughs> you know, if you want to have the hot potato <laughs> to pass around when this is going to be uh, discussed and maybe even get in touch with some of the legislators who are currently you know, designing the policy and see how we can help uh, in, um, in thinking about this, uh, this issue. So next up is my other paper, which is almost finished, uh, about uh, Alaska's case and looking at impacts of a universal basic income style policy on the labor market. Yes? Just before you move. <coughs> I have some conceptual misunderstanding. The carbon rebate and universal based income, in my mind, are not the same. Okay. For, for universal based income, it should be something at least meaningful for an income. Here you are talking about small amount of rebates, minus tax, which won't be really income. I mean, it will be additional to somebody's income. But it won't be, the idea of universal based income will be minimum wage, that minimum living wage that everybody gets. Right. So, so that to, for me, they're totally different. Alaska may be a much better example. But right. So uh, I understand what you're saying, that the kinds of amounts that we're talking about in a carbon uh, fee and rebate are relatively small and not enough to cover basic uh, living expenses. But the way I was seeing this is as a politically feasible way to get some, uh, you know, um, part of the way uh, towards a basic income. And also, also, as an economist, I'm interested in evaluating things. So it can be hard to start with a bang bang uh, policy. So having, a, you know, partial, it's also sometimes called a partial basic income, so called when it's like smaller than. Uh, what is necessary for uh, living expenses, to me it's a laboratory to think about how you might uh, uh, go from there. Now in terms of the general structure, it actually is very similar because the carbon tax is a tax, instead you could do the income tax, but in any case you have to pay for the thing. So if you're gonna pay for the thing with a tax, there's gonna be a tax and then people get you know, back money on a per capita basis, but if you were gonna finance it not through shutting down existing programs but for a tax, it's just that carbon tax is one particular type of tax that right now has rather more political support than other types of taxes, but tax is tax. You still have to raise the money somewhere, at least if you're not willing to cut uh, you know, other benefits. So I'd argue that in its, in its mechanism, it's quite similar to what you do if you wanted the basic income financed by tax, but yes, in its amount, it is a modest, uh, modest amount. Now, as, as I will discuss in, in this, it turn, research shows that certainly in terms of the influence of these amounts on labor market outcomes, the influence is quite proportional to the amount. There, there, it's not like there is a critical amount that is going to change everything. So as such, you know, that too is, is, is important to, uh, to know. All right, so next up then is my work on Alaska. Uh, looking at the impact of uh, basic income that exists in Alaska, and they don't call it basic income, uh, it, it's the Alaska Permanent Fund Dividend, but it functions uh, essentially as a basic income. So um, first, let me give you some context from economics. So this is more an economics paper, the prior was more like political science, uh, about uh, unconditional cash transfers. This is the 
uh, econ speak for <laughs> giving people a cash transfer without conditions, which is what UBI is, so unconditional cash transfer. So what we expect is that uh, this uh, unconditional cash transfer is going to have what we call an income effect, meaning that if you receive income with no conditions, basic economic theory predicts that you're going to work less. Uh, because the assumption is work is unpleasant, so if you get income, that allows you to buy out of some unpleasantness uh, <laughs> by working less. That's the basic assumption. And uh, in fact, if you uh, look at some of the uh, studies, you find that a 10% increase in earn earned income reduces earned income, so you know, your income that you're uh, gaining through working, by about 1%. And so which studies show that? Uh, so again, th if you want to read more in much more detail about this, you can look at my review of the literature. Uh, th there are negative income tax experiments in the US in the 70s that show about this size of an effect. And also for looking at lottery winners, it mm -hmm. uh, shows a similar effect. So lottery winners are relevant because when you win, win at the lottery, usually the wins come on an installment basis for a very long time. And of course, there's no conditions because you just won at the lottery. So it's very similar for the individual to what they might be getting uh, with, uh, with a basic income. Uh, however, in many cases, prior literature uh, finds no income uh, effect on labor supply, meaning that work is not affected. So some studies find this, but in some other studies, you don't find any effect. So for example, most uh, effects that are estimated from the negative income tax are not statistically significant, for one thing. Uh, so therefore, we cannot uh, be sure that they're different from zero. And furthermore, uh, the Unfortunately, even though this was an experiment, there were some implementation issues. And in the end, the effects were overestimated due to income misreporting and selective attrition. So I'm not going to go too much into that unless someone wants to ask a question about how. But basically, when they collected data, it turned out that uh, uh, this uh, ended up in overestimating the labor supply effect, meaning that you would think that the universal basic income decreases work more than it really does due to these issues uh, with the implementation and data analysis in this, uh, in this policy. But if anyone wants more details, I'm happy to elaborate. Another uh, paper looking at this is uh, the, uh, concerning the Eastern Band of Cherokees. So this is a tribe of uh, uh, Native Americans, and they have income from their local casino that is uh, given to every member of the tribe with no conditions. So that's where it's similar to uh, a basic income. And that had no effect at all on, uh, on working, even though this was pretty high amount of about 4,000 to 6,000 uh, uh, per person uh, per year. Uh, also, there's many uh, experiments in developing countries. So uh, scientists have taken to doing this because in developing countries, by definition, incomes are low. So it's very easy to do an experiment giving people basic income. <laughs> in a developing country versus in the US. So there's lots of experiments like this. And the you know, outcomes from this literature, this is a review of literature only from developing countries, only with randomized controlled trial, is that there is no effect on working uh, from receiving this kind of unconditional cash uh, in these developing countries. So this is the state of the literature before my paper. Uh, so limitations of this literature are that, first of all, these cash transfers are generally not universal uh, within a territory. So obviously, if it's an experiment, you choose a treated group that is only a limited number of people. It's not everyone uh, who receives that. And what's the problem with that? Well, the problem is that if everyone receives it, there could be what we call macro effects, meaning effects on uh, the economy that derive from everyone receiving it and not just a few uh, people. Uh, secondly, most cash transfers that have been studied are temporary. Uh, for example, the negative income tax experiment just lasted three to five years. And so that, too, can bias our estimates of the response because it's not the same thing to think, oh, I'm going to get this for a couple of years or you know, I can expect to get this uh, for whole, uh, my whole life. Uh, the Eastern Band of Cherokee natural experiment I was talking about uh, before is the only example that is a permanent cash flow. At least you know, in the foreseeable future, they have the casino and it's going to keep going. Uh, however, only midterm effects are known, and even in this case, it's not for everyone because it's only for tribal members. There's plenty of other people living in the same area who don't receive this, uh, this benefit. So as such, uh, we think that the Alaska Permanent Fund is the best example in the US of something like a universal basic income. 
So uh, the Alaska Permanent Fund was created by an amendment to the state constitution in 1976, and it says that at least 25% of all mineral lists and so on uh, must go to the state in this fund. And so the fund is invested in the diversified portfolio, so this is like a sovereign wealth fund, uh, and the dividend payments from this fund, so again, this is not money that's coming directly from the oil, I want to make it clear. This is money that is coming from the financial returns to a fund, and the fund was fed through the revenue from oil, but it's not that people are getting the revenue from oil. They're getting the financial returns from uh, this fund. And so the payment is once a year, and uh, it ranges in size from one year to the next because it depends on the returns of the fund on the last uh, three years. And so uh, it ranged historically from uh, 331 do nominal dollars, which is about you know, close to $800 uh, in today's dollars to $2,000 uh, in 2015. And so, uh, and by the way, right now, the dividend is under attack because uh, Alaska is going through a budget crisis as many states are, and they want to use more of the dividend to pay for current expenses versus giving it, that it to the people. And let me tell you that Alaskans are not happy, and actually they want to amend the Constitution to put the dividend itself as a you know, part of the Constitution so that it's not possible to take it back uh, from the Alaskans. So to me, that's a very interesting example of like how once you put something in place and people like it, you know, it can become a permanent fixture. <laughs> Uh, in, the, uh, in the policy world. Uh, so key advantages of this Alaska case compared to the experiments in prior studies are that one, it's universal and un unconditional. It's literally for all Alaskans uh, if they reside in Alaska during the past year. So basically this includes children, so you have to be like about one year old because you have to be a resident uh, for a year and essentially every person who is legally resident in Alaska. So that in particular includes refugees. So legally settled refugees in Alaska are eligible uh, for the Alaska Permanent Fund uh, dividends. So it's universal, it's unconditional, and it's permanent. So this is something, it's not like, uh, oh, you can guess this for a couple of years. It's been going on for 30 years and ongoing for the foreseeable future. As I said, there's some debate right now about how much the dividend should be, but it looks like uh, it's going to potentially be enshrined in the Constitution to make it even more uh, durable. So that's why we believe that uh, the Alaska Permanent Fund dividend is the best example of a universal basic income style policy that is long term and to scale for everyone in a territory in Alaska, in the US. This is the best example of such a policy that uh, we currently have. So the research questions for this particular paper uh, are to ask what are the impacts of this universal and permanent income transfer on the labor market. I'm a, most of my work is in labor economics, so these are outcomes that I'm a specialist of and I really care about, so I was interested in, in looking at uh, those outcomes. So we're going to uh, concentrate on two particular outcomes. One is the employment rate, also called extensive margin in econ speak, but basically just looking at the share of employed people in the Alaskan population. So that's all we're looking at. So are Alaskans working? And then also looking at full-time versus part-time. So how many of the Alaskans are working part-time? Because maybe even though people don't stop working, maybe they are going to be more likely to work uh, part-time. And uh, furthermore, uh, we are going to ask whether aggregate impacts, so meaning the impacts if it's universal really and everyone gets it in a territory, those kind of macro effects, are there any different from the micro effects? And micro means, you know, if you just give it to a few people like you would do in an experiment, is that different from giving it to everyone? So this is something that we hope to learn from this study as compared to uh, the prior literature. So what are our main results, in case I don't get around to finish uh, uh, my uh, slides here? Um, so the synthetic, what do we do? So we first use a method called the synthetic control panel approach. We use current population survey data. This is the data set that's used to calculate the official unemployment rate in the US over the period 1977 to 2014. And so what the method does is pretty intuitive, actually. So as you know, just like in a randomized control trial, you have a, a control and a treatment. Well, here, obviously, it's not an experiment. And in fact, it's like every Alaskan gets it. So it's even less of an experiment. There's no one who's left behind, essentially, in Alaska from, uh, from this policy. 
There are a few minor exceptions, but basically everyone gets it. Um, and so in order to get around that, we still want a control you know, a group. So what do we do? We select match controls for Alaska, meaning other states, uh, based on pre-intervention data. So we look at Alaska before the permanent fund dividend started, and we look in the US what are the most similar states to Alaska before. And these are going to uh, serve as control groups to compare the outcomes of the control states to the outcomes in Alaska, and therefore infer what the effect of the policy uh, was. So we find that the dividend payments have a very small positive uh, but insignificant effect on the employment to population. It's essentially uh, zero. Uh, the dividend payments, so therefore no effect on working at all, just people working. Uh, but we also find that dividend payments increase part-time employment as a share of the population by 1.8 percentage point up from 10% in the pre-period. So this is an almost 20% increase in the share of Alaskans uh, who are working part-time. Uh, we also find that the dividend payments have a negative, about uh, 0.62 hours less per week uh, effect uh, on the employed, but this effect is not statistically significant. So it's a small effect of a half an hour, roughly, uh, per week, but it's not uh, statistically significant for those who are currently working. Uh, and uh, finally, you know, I told you about would it make a difference if we give it to everyone or not to everyone. And so one of the economic channels that could make a difference is that if you give it to everyone, this can stimulate consumption, especially among poorer people. You give them this income, they go out and buy things with it. And so what, uh, what is going to happen is that that means that local businesses have more demand and they are likely to want to hire more people and this wanting to hire more people can counterbalance the fact that people want to work less. So on the one hand maybe people want to work less but employers are constantly saying hey do you want to work for me? Do you want to work for me? So that can you know uh, counterbalance uh, the effect. And in fact we find some evidence consistent with that because we find that in the tradable sector meaning sectors that do not mostly depend on local demand so things like manufacturing, they are sold everywhere, not particularly in Alaska. There you have actually a somewhat negative employment effect. Whereas in the non-tradable sector, meaning you know, hairdressers, anything that is consumed locally, you have a somewhat positive employment effect. And so the two kind of cancel out to a big zero when you look at Alaska. So uh, therefore, the answer is, if you give it to everyone, does it matter? Yes, it matters because it changes patterns of consumption and therefore the demand for labor and ultimately the employment effect at the level of the whole uh, Alaska. And so overall, uh, we believe these results are informative about the long run macro effect of a universal basic income on a uh, regional economy and perhaps also on the US as a whole if something like this uh, came to pass at the national level. Any questions? Okay. So Let's get a little bit into the weeds about uh, first the institutional context. So in the 1970s, so it's the story of how this came about is itself quite instructive. In the 1970s, Alaska experienced a large uptick in revenue from oil extraction. And uh, in particular, there was a 900 million sale of an oil lease in 1969. And it was mostly spent down by the state in the subsequent years. So a huge, uh, a raise of the income of the state and then you know it was all uh, going away very quickly and so what happened is that people were not very happy they felt that the state government had failed them by squandering the money on you know on unwise uh, projects and so the Alaska Permanent Fund was created in 1976 uh, to constrain government spending so make sure that you know the money isn't squandered uh, in uh, ways that the citizens don't have uh, power to control and also for the future because they realize that this oil revenue isn't necessarily forever and that therefore it is not fair to have it all spent down by the current generation someone in the future our children and grandchildren should be able to benefit too and through this fund, through putting the money in the fund and then only taking out the financial returns from the fund, this would ensure the viability of the system in the long run and over the generations. So that was another motivation uh, for uh, doing the fund rather than just you know, getting the money from the oil and spending it uh, through the state uh, budget. And uh, 
Furthermore, the Alaska personal income tax was also abolished in 1980. And uh, finally, the dividend disbursement started in June 14, 1982. It took a while between the creation of the fund uh, in 76 and the dividend because there was debate about who should be getting the dividend. So you see, at the time, there were, you know, there were discussions like, is this for everyone, not for everyone? Who is it for? And one big thing is that initially, they wanted to restrict it to people who have li lived in Alaska for long enough. And ultimately, through the courts, this was struck down as not being legal. So in the end, you know, it was essentially for everyone. You just had to uh, live there for one, uh, one year. Uh, and there's a literature uh, looking at how people spend uh, this dividend payment. And you know, the most recent uh, paper shows that most of the dividend payment is spent in the quarter where it is received. So you, know, you can look at people spending, and that's uh, the key uh, result from that, uh, from that paper. OK, so let's talk a little bit about the data and the econometric uh, specification. So Alaska, so the current population survey, as I told you, this is the key government survey that's being used to estimate the official unemployment rate, and it runs back quite a while. But unfortunately for our study, Alaska is only available as a separate state in 1977. So that's why this is where the study starts. Before that, Alaska is you know, concatenated with other states, so we don't have data for Alaska uh, itself. And then uh, we use uh, this uh, IPOMS uh, CPS, which is a standardized uh, CPS that you can download uh, online to look at the employment to population, active labor force participation, and uh, part-time work. And then uh, we have another data extract also from the current population survey that we used to look at hours worked uh, last week among the employed. And so our data is yearly, as I, as <coughs> as I said, and it starts uh, you know, in 1977. We moved the beginning of the year to the middle of the year because the dividend disbursement started in July. So in order to align the event with the data, we move the beginning of the year to the middle of the year. But that's just a technical uh, detail. The data is then collapsed by year and state using weights. So essentially, this is just a state panel where we collapse the outcome at, for every year, for every state. And we use weights uh, because the, there are um, weights for sampling, right, to, get, to make it representative of the population in every, uh, every state. So uh, how we're going to identify a causal effect here of this intervention, which is in this case the Alaska Permanent Fund Dividend? So we have Alaska, that's our treatment unit. And so the question is how, as I told you, we want to choose some control states. How are we going to do that? Uh, and then <coughs> how do we assess statistical significance? So what we end up doing is to choose controls with a data-driven method called the synthetic control. Uh, and these are the references that explain that. And, um, we also ad adopt a permutation method to assess significance. So intuitively, what that means is that we uh, look at uh, Alaska, and then we compare Alaska. We say, pretend that the Alaska Permanent Fund happened in Massachusetts, in Pennsylvania, yeah, in every other state, and we compute an effect, you know, a placebo effect as if. And then we rank all the effects that we have and if the effect for Alaska is significant, it should be among the 5% you know, biggest effects of all of these placebo effects. So that's what's called the permutation uh, test in this, uh, in this context. So OK, so what uh, <coughs> I told you that we're going to choose states that are similar to Alaska. Similar in what? So what do we match on? So we match on the outcome variable in the pre-period. By outcome variable, I mean if we study employment, we choose states that have the same employment to population as Alaska. If we study part-time, we choose states that have the same you know, part-time rate as Alaska. So that's the first uh, variable. Gender, so that doesn't do too much because you know, gender is pretty balanced in most states. Uh, education categories, so three uh, distinct educational categories, therefore two shares that we uh, match on. Age categories, so obviously those two are very important for labor market outcomes because different education and ages will yield generally different employment rates. Uh, and also industry categories, so five different industry categories. These are important because over time uh, economic shocks are different depending on your industrial structure and Alaska is quite different from many other states so it's important to uh, be able to take that into account. And so of course, this whole exercise is much more credible. You know, you might think Alaska is so special. How can you convince us that you know, there are states that look like Alaska? 
And uh, of course, everything I'm telling you is going to be more credible. If you can believe me that I found good controls for Alaska. And uh, actually, there is a way to uh, assess that by uh, looking at the pre-period fit uh, or uh, through the root mean square error for pre-intervention outcome. So basically what that means is before this whole thing started, just how similar are the outcomes in Alaska versus its control states, you know, how good can I make them? Do I find states that are essentially exactly the same or not? And uh, furthermore, as I told you, everything is uh, assessed by the permutation test, which means I'm going to compare how well I can match Alaska versus how well I can match Pennsylvania, California, every other possible state. So that's going to give me a relative performance of how well I can match Alaska versus how well you could match any other state uh, in the country. And so we're going to focus the discussion here on outcomes where uh, this root mean square error is below the 15th percentile, meaning that in this case, Alaska was much better than 85% of other states in the pre period. I insist, better than 85% of other states. And so these outcomes that we can match really well are the employment to population and the part time employment to population. And so even though a priori you might think it's very hard to match Alaska, actually for our main outcome of interest that I told you results about, which is employment and part-time, we can match Alaska better than 85% uh, of other states by using this, uh, this technique. All right, so now let's look at results. So the first uh, uh, table that I'm showing you here uh, is going through, well, which states are similar to Alaska, okay? And you saw what I was matching on, which was uh, essentially the outcome itself, so employment, and then uh, education, age, industry, and gender. And these are the states that come out to be more similar to Alaska with weights, so the weights add up to one. So you can see that Utah, Wyoming, Washington State, and Nevada are the most similar with, in this case, uh, really Utah and Wyoming w being the most similar. I was really struck when I saw this because this is a data-driven method. I didn't put mountainous state in there. Remember, it was a match on you know, age and education and industry. But it turns out that it was matched with other you know, mountainous, somewhat uh, you know, sparsely populated uh, states. And uh, you, know, you can, as you would do in a randomized controlled trial, you can check covariate balance. So meaning to see if the characteristics of the treated unit are similar to the control unit prior uh, to the intervention. And you know you can see. I mean, we can match the employment uh, level perfectly, for example. Uh, and um, most of the other covariates are extremely uh, similar in the treated group, which here is Alaska, and the synthetic control, which is a weighted average of all these other states that you had in the prior uh, table. So this is, uh, in a way, the main result of the paper illustrated graphically. This shows you. Over time, the employment rate, I repeat, this is employment divided by population. Um, and this is over time, starting in 1977 to 2014. The blue line is Alaska, so this is our treatment group. And this, the uh, red line, dotted line, is the synthetic control. So these other states that we found to be most similar to Alaska. So, and this is where the dividend started. So you can note that in the pre-period, the other states have the same level of employment and also follow the same you know, path in over time as Alaska. And afterwards, with the exception of these two bumps here, pretty much you know, we perfectly match. So essentially, these states, these control states were similar to Alaska uh, in employment and they remain on average similar to Alaska after the fact. Ergo, there is no employment effect because when you average this whole thing, it's zero. Here it's a bit uh, you know, below, here it's a bit <laughs> above. Overall, obviously, in this it's clearly zero. So overall, if you look at the whole period, there is zero effect uh, on employment in Alaska from having this uh, new policy uh, right here. So uh, you know, I can show this to you with standard errors that are calculated not parametrically. What this does is look at every other state that has a pseudo you know, intervention at the same time, and also every possible year that the intervention could have happened. So we run many placebos, and relative to all these placebos, 
you can clearly see that Alaska is smack in the middle. It is not at all exceptional uh, compared to uh, other uh, placebo uh, groups. So we can put this in, this in the table, and we find that the estimate for the employment rate is positive but not significant. This is the p-value, so <laughs> clearly <laughs> not significant. Uh, and then we also looked at labor force participation, where, uh, so you see for employment, we match Alaska better than 90% 90, uh, 90 of other states. So it's like really tip top, well matched for employment. For uh, labor force participation, not so bad, but we only match it better than 45% of other states. Uh, and then we find a slightly positive effect of 1.2 percentage points for labor force participation, but it's not uh, statistically significant. So I don't want to put too much weight on that. The outcome is that employment doesn't uh, change. That's the first result. Then we want to look at part-time work and hours, because even though people are working, they might be working less than they would have in the absence of this policy. So um, we redo the matching here. Why? Because now we want to match for states who are very similar in part-time and these other things, but we're, we're really interested in other states who have the same uh, part-time rate. And in this case, the most similar state is Nevada. Yet another mountain state, followed by Wyoming, which was also in the top uh, for the prior uh, exercise. And so here we can also again uh, check balance of covariates, and uh, it also works uh, really well. And this is the figure. So this is showing you the uh, number of part-time workers divided by the population in Alaska. This is the blue line, that's Alaska. And the red line is the uh, control states, which is mostly Nevada, plus a bunch of other, uh, other states. And so what we see here, right, is that a couple of years after the permanent fund dividend started, the part-time rate in Alaska increased quite a bit relative to the control state uh, where the part-time rate was relatively uh, stable, you know, with ups and downs uh, throughout, uh, throughout this, uh, this period. Uh, and so, you know, is this, however, statistically significant? That is the question. So we can assess that. And we find that, on average, part-time work was 1.8 percentage point more common after the policy was in place. And it's significant with a p-value of 0 0.025, so below uh, 0, uh, 0 0.05. And so that's basically uh, showing you the result for part-time. We are matched better than almost 90% of other states. So that's the how well uh, we match. In terms of hours worked last week, so that's only for those who work. So if you work how many hours? You can see about the 0.6 hour less, or about half an hour less per week, but the effect with a p-value of 0.15 is not uh, statistically significant. So, okay. Now, these are the key you know, headline results. Let me uh, talk to you about some robustness tests we've done and some additional uh, results. So, uh, the first thing is that our pre-period for our main analysis only starts in 77. This, you might think that this is not ideal because maybe you want to match on outcomes over a longer uh, pre-period. And uh, we did that uh, and you know, used the census from 1960 to match you know, for similar states to Alaska already in 1960. There's a trade-off in doing that because on the one hand, you might say that states that are similar to Alaska in 1960, that's an even better control group. But since the situation everywhere changes, you might say, well, that's not as good as a control group because you know, the situation in these other states could have changed quite a lot for other reasons since then. So you know, whether you really want to do this or not is debatable on like, statistical grounds. But in any case, we have done it in case you're concerned. And what you can see is that in this case, the effect for Alaska seems somewhat positive uh, in employment. So Alaska is doing better than its control states if you try to match you know, as far back as uh, 1960. And so the employment uh, effect, if you, in our main specification, which we think is most believable, is zero. But if you want to uh, match either from 1970 using the census or as far back as 1960, in that case, you find the three percentage point increase in employment. And it's, you know, marginally significant, below 10% uh, level of, uh, of significance. But note that the pre-period match is not quite as good. So we match better than 40% of other states, but it's not as neatly matched as in our uh, main uh, exercise. 
Uh, we can uh, also look at the results by gender, so which can be an interesting uh, cut of the data. So when you look at uh, the uh, employment rate, uh, the matching of the separately by gender isn't great, but it seems that perhaps men were more likely to be employed, women a little bit less, but you know, I don't want to put too much weight on this. However, for part-time, we have very good match with a low rank for the match. And there we can a bit more confidently say that much of the effect of increased part-time was among women. Men maybe also increased part-time a little bit, but you know, that effect of seeing more part-time was mostly a uh, you know, women-driven uh, phenomenon. So they, I, I already showed you that the part-time work increased, and it mostly increased among uh, women which is consistent with other findings from uh, the literature on, uh, on the labor market. So uh, discussion. Overall, we found that the labor market impact of this long-term universal basic income like transfer in Alaska, in terms of employment, it was zero or perhaps moderately positive. Uh, Part-time work uh, increased, meaning an intensive margin reduction, so people working less but not stopping working as per the first result. Uh, and then if you try to think about the general equilibrium effect, uh, you know, individual studies show that people, individuals do tend to work less if they're the only ones who receive this. So we think that this zero employment effect could be explained by uh, what we call general equilibrium effect. So the effect of giving it to everyone. And so in particular, for example, prior evidence shows that uh, unemployment insurance benefit spending uh, leads to uh, labor demand effect. So, you know, when people get more unemployment benefits, they spend more. That means that firms want to hire in order to satisfy this higher spending. So that has been shown for unemployment insurance benefits. And we think that this could explain also our results uh, here. And we've also f we also argued that the labor demand effect should be bigger in the non-tradables. So again, the non-tradables are uh, the kinds of goods and services that are consumed locally, like hairdressers, for example. And we find, indeed, that we have a bigger employment effect and a smaller part-time effect in the non-tradables, meaning goods and services that are consumed locally, which is consistent with this labor demand effect, that giving people cash increases consumption, increases spending, which means more demand for companies who want to hire uh, more, uh, more workers. And so, therefore, we find consistent evidence with this prediction and so this bolsters the evidence for <coughs> a labor demand effect that is induced by the universal basic income at the macro level in Alaska. So what is the conclusion from this uh, study? The existing literature on unconditional cash transfers mostly is concerned with transfers that are not universal and are short run. Here, uh, the universal basic income like cash transfer in Alaska is unconditional, universal, long run, and therefore can capture uh, macro effects. The macro effect of the Alaska Permanent Fund dividend on labor supply is less negative, we think, than the micro effect of an unconditional cash transfer. And the dividend payments in the end had a very small positive but insignificant effect on the employment to population. And the dividend payments increase part-time employment as a share of the population by about 1.8 percentage point, up from 10 percent prior to, uh, to the policy. And so given that there is growing policy interest in universal basic income, the Alaskan long-run experience, we think, is informative about the likely labor market impacts of a universal basic income that would be adopted on a large scale. And uh, in future work about Alaska, I am going to examine the impact of this universal basic income on prices. So exploiting the fact that, as I told you, it comes every October. In initially it was June, but in many recent years it's always on the same date in October. So we can use uh, a consumer panel data to look at prices. And remember, most of it is spent in the following quarter. So we can meaningfully ask whether prices you know, in the last quarter <laughs> are inflated relative to uh, the rest of the year or not. And that will be very interesting because I, effect, I expect potentially different effects depending on what products uh, we're talking about. So that's, you know, stay tuned. I'm going to uh, do that uh, next. So the overall conclusion about the universal basic income is that, first of all, the universal basic income has no effect 
on employment at the macro level, which is the paper that you've just seen. Uh, it has positive effects, though, on health and education uh, from the work that I have reviewed uh, in my review of the literature that I haven't touched upon here, but if you're interested, you can have a look at the review. A carbon fee and rebate is a promising policy to implement a universal basic income at the state level. So if you wanted to start at the state level, which seems like it's politically the most expedient and realistic way to go, this carbon fee and rebate is a promising policy. I have ongoing work with Boris Shor on the political support for universal basic income and for the carbon fee and dividend, and this will allow us to estimate support both at the state and the electoral district level. Uh, this work overall should uh, inform the national debate and state policy initiatives, including in Hawaii, Pennsylvania, D.C., Washington State, Massachusetts, you name it. Uh, so I very much uh, look forward to be able to contribute to this uh, debate. Thank you. Yes. That's what I, actually my question is surrounding is the, the creation of these funds. Um, do you see, you know, different states have different industries that they specialize in? I mean, the states that you focus in are focusing on the manufacturing, whereas some states might focus on maybe the healthcare sector or some other or some other or some other aspect of the private market that could significantly contribute to funds. Do you see that there could be a, a level of support? For funds at the state level right. to contribute to these, uh, to contribute to a universal basic income? Um, and if not, or if so, do you see something similar happening to that at the federal mm -hmm. level? Like a kind of a federal fund, fund that's right. created? So this is a great question, and actually there's just been some pieces on Twitter uh, and Bloomberg supporting this idea of a national wealth fund to finance a basic income. So people are thinking about this, however, I see this as right now politically highly speculative because I'm not sure you know, right now that there would be too much support for it. I think Alaska was a bit special because they had all this like sudden uh, money inflow from the oil and so th there was a moment in time where uh, there was a time to do that uh, in Alaska. So you know, it's worth thinking about, uh, but I, I, would, I would just think that politically it's perhaps not the most expedient right now to go this way, and it, I feel that the carbon fee is somewhat more realistic, at least in certain states, you know, not necessarily in every state, but in some states, I think that there could be uh, support. Uh, yes, Ram, you had a question. Um, sure. No, sorry. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Either way. Thank you. Okay. Um, I, I might have missed this, but in your discussion about the effect on um, hiring, mm -hmm. um, The numbers seem to imply that it could have an, a positive effect right. on hiring. One of the things, of course, as you know well, we're finding here right now in this country is that the, even though the economy is improving, people are the industries and the businesses are not hiring. Mm -hmm. So, do you, what? How does that factor into your thinking there? Yes. So, so the results. I, you know, I, I think that. It's uh, reasonable to think that there is no or maybe a small effect. So given that the positive effects we find on hiring are not very robust, I would hesitate to say that you should do this you know, in order to stimulate hiring. It's more that I, I was uh, interested in shutting down the argument that this is yeah. going to harm sure. uh, working. And I think there there's solid evidence that this you know, <laughs> would not happen. Is this a policy to stimulate employment? Possibly. But I think we need yeah. you know, more work uh, to uh, think about this more rigorously and maybe other experiments to understand this channel of uh, you know, how this could stimulate demand. Great. Yeah. This is beautiful. And while you present the Alaska, I had uh, in my mind a criticism that I didn't know how to phrase. But you'll help me. Your, last, your future thinks is about prices. Mm -hmm. And I remember when we had the debate about school voucher, Robert Frank said, once you give every kid $2,000, the cost of education will go by $2,000. Now, you're going to look at it only in the period after they get the money. So one thing is 
looking for paying debts. So how they spend it is one thing, but it's also the prices in Alaska, compared to the prices in the rest of the country, may have gone up. Well, it's true that everything shipping that might be expensive, but what people get is about two thousand dollars now. It may be I don't I don't I don't have proof, but intuitively I don't accept the imaginary idea that it's lead to labor demand. I think that increase the price, and in order to keep the same quality of life, you can't you can't decide okay I have two thousand dollars I can work less. Mm -hmm. Because what you purchase compared to people in the South and all other right. of the United States will demand keep working. Because now as a business I can charge you a little right. more for everything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so okay, so two parts to answer this. So your concern is about the fact that this UBI could increase prices in such a way that the real income after you account for price level may not increase as much or maybe not at all in, a, in an extreme case. So this is a, a, a possibility in theory, but what it depends on is uh, the elasticity of supply as we call it in economics. Meaning when you increase prices on the producer side, so those who want to sell you stuff, are they going to react to this by producing more widgets so hoo -hoo, they can sell more because now you have more money or just by saying, hi, you have more money, let me just charge you more. What does this depend on fundamentally, and that's another topic of my research currently, is the degree of competition. So the more producers are fighting for your money and the less likely that they're going to increase prices and instead try to serve you more and better products that your money can buy. So that is, that's why I was saying I expect potentially different effects depending on different categories of product, in particular as a function of the competition in the market for that particular product. So that's sort of the theoretical yeah, answer. I understand, but so much, yes, yes, but nevertheless, the, you know, like the m for depending on the category of goods, Alaska might be uh, supplied by many different suppliers in some categories of goods and by not so many in others. So that's why I'm interested in looking at that. Now, in terms of, it's true what I mentioned to you that the effect on price that I was going to look at is within the year, but actually we want to do it two prong. First, we want to use the same so, you know, I, I want to, I think this will be useful. If you think about the strategy we used here, so <laughs> like this, for example, we can use this instead of, here the outcome is part-time, but instead I can look at consumer price index as the outcome. And that will give me an idea of the overall yeah. price level in Alaska versus other states. Yeah. And furthermore, if I want to get more detail in like what products and is this like within the year, I can also look within a particular year whether prices are uh, higher after October. Uh, because I agree with you, just looking within the year doesn't necessarily speak to the prices all year long because they might not be higher in October, but just higher the whole year and then it's still a concern. So I think that by leveraging those two strategies together, you know, we can say more about what is really going on. Yeah. Um, so I don't know if you, this, this might be even beyond the scope of what you're yeah. discussing, predicated on the success of industries that some might construe are harmful to environmental Yes. <laughs> and so when it comes to how the, the funds are, are funded, is there concern for the industries which are contributing to those funds? And if so, because it's like we're talking about a social welfare benefit that might come at the expense, some might construe as coming right. at the expense of something else. Are there concerns or conversations that might be had well, yeah, I, I agree. You know, you could say, oh, this is all like the oil and gas industry, but that's why I think the most feasible generalization of this is not to create a fund in other states necessarily, but to do a carbon tax, which has the opposite effect of, you know, making uh, carbon use more expensive. And that's the whole point is to reduce uh, the use of, uh, of carbon. But that's certainly something that needs to be part of the conversation. Mark, you had a question? Um, okay, is that, uh, I'm unfamiliar with this. My understanding from what you said was that uh, essentially after the revenue started coming in, there was an expansion in state spending. Yes. And that this policy was passed to constrain state spending. Exactly. So I guess my question is, what, what were the cuts that accompanied this in terms of state spending? And what were the implications of those for social welfare? Because I guess I'm, 
I guess my concern is, given that this was about cutting, cutting state spending, mm -hmm. that this really isn't, that the metaphor that this is universal basic income doesn't quite hold. Yes, I hear you. But the thing is that you have to remember that it cuts sp state spending relative to spending all the royalties right now. So what you have to imagine is, actually, I at some point wanted to get data on like the budget, like the spending in Alaska, which must exist, but we haven't done so yet. But basically, we, before all this oil rush, state spending was something. Then the oil came and <laughs> state spending. And so the point of this fund is just to make it come down to more or less what it was before. So it's not to decrease like state spending, but to, instead of spending more with this new source of revenue, give it back to the people, which I think is slightly different uh, proposition. So the concern was to not have an expansion of state spending that was seen as wasteful with this new revenue, but instead give it back to the people, which is not the same as taking what we have and trying to cut. So of course, temporarily, it could be that whatever they were spending extra on got cut, but you have to understand that this is relative to the prior baseline. I don't know if, if that, that, that makes sense. Uh, I guess the, uh, I, I, I don't have, uh, I'm with Ram and I don't have this fully formulated, but I guess the issue is in terms of were the, whatever happened in terms of state spending, was, was that taking stuff that the state was essentially providing in terms of the social welfare benefit to people, uh, turning it into a privatized benefit so that you need to look at the trade-off between the state providing stuff yes. to people and them getting cash. And yes. I don't, I don't know how that influences that. I, I agree, and to, truthfully, I don't know exactly what exactly they spent on with the extra money before this cut down the line. And this seems related to the debate that the progressives have about the idea that maybe if we had a universal basic income, this could undermine you know, existing right. other welfare right. programs. So I think that, that plays into that whole debate that is really worth thinking about and thinking about the relative benefits of UBI versus, say, food stamps. So this is the kind of stuff that I think there'd be a lot of pressure to cut that if we had a decent level universal basic income because food stamps are fairly similar to cash. And some people may say, why do we have this? You know, let's cut this. There'll be some you know, money saved for the government. And that is going to you know, be controversial. Because some people say, well, no, we don't want to cut this. And some, you know, so yes. So I'm wondering if you have an estimation as in the tax elasticity of the carbon tax. Because the premise of redistribution is based on like, those who potentially the consumer of carbon right. will pay more, right? But if the tax elasticity actually is geared towards like the the um, potentially not the consumer, but the firm itself or other, then potentially the they are not paying the tax or some the consumer who are not paying but the firm is paying. Like who right. bought who bear the tax burden? Right. The so who bears the tax burden is complicated but this the estimates I was giving you are based on you know, existing research and projections from <laughs> that. But the general idea of this carbon fee, as is proposed by many, is that it would be levied at the first time that the carbon enters the production process, at the refinery level, gas extraction. Whenever it first enters, that's the only time it's taxed. But of course, by incidence, this is going to likely translate into price increases all the way through the production process and ultimately be paid for by the consumers partially, again, depending on how exactly this you know, trickles down towards consumers and how different links in the production absorb or don't absorb uh, the tax in question. So it is no trivial matter to say exactly how this is going to play out, but there are people whose specialty it is and have made projections that I, I would not put my hand in the fire about because I am not a specialist of those kinds of projections, but they, it, you know, it's a well uh, worked out area in the area of environmental economists and people who you know, deal with those kinds of issues, but it's definitely very interesting and very relevant to the, to the policy. I just have yeah. synthetic control um, as a design to um, match up um, the difference produced by the policy, the impact of the policy, right? right? So uh, the conclusion... No, we match up, sorry, we match up the pre-period, so before the policy, and then we compare in the policy yeah. period. To so, see yeah. the impact of exactly. the policy. Exactly, exactly. Um, my question is, so 
in some some uh, because of this design, like the conclusion we can draw is basically um, from the context of Alaskan Alaska and uh, Alaskan like states, right? right? So whether um, the universal basic income would change the unemployment rate um, also can only be extended to Alaska and also Alaska like states. Absolutely. So I think you're, uh, uh, you're asking a question of external validity. Can we be sure that it will work like in Alaska? The answer is who knows, but certainly in terms of Compared to other literature, I would argue that this has much more external validity because it's not just a few people, but you know the whole state are receiving this for a long period of time. So despite the fact that Alaska itself is, of course, a bit different from uh, other states, I would argue that the lessons we can draw are nevertheless somewhat more you know, relevant than the lessons you can draw from a localized, you know, randomized control trial that only lasts a couple of years. So as usual, we have trade-offs. Uh, in research and you know, short of actually doing it in the whole US, it's hard to be completely sure that the effects would be exactly the same. Let me follow up on this yeah. question. Um, slightly going a different way on this, but so, I'm, I'm, and I'm sure you have a good methodological rationale for this, but I'm, I'm curious, why create a one synthetic group out of multiple states rather than just seeing what those other, almost treating those other states as treatments in relation to the specific treatment that you're interested in, that is Alaska, right? So then in this way, you're able to actually potentially see the nuances and particularities of history in and of itself beyond 1980 or whatever right. that particular year is. Um, because we know things are changing. Right. So, and, and in fact, by, by having, by clumping all of them together into the synthetic group, you mask those nuances, you mask right. those particularities. Right, so, so the reason for putting them together is that because each one of them is a little, so for the simplest reason is like that. Suppose that we have two states, oh, I think there was Utah and Wyoming. Let's say Utah has slightly higher employment rate than Alaska. Wyoming, on the other hand, has maybe a point, a point more employment, the other one has a point less. Remember, I want my control group to have exactly the same level of employment as Alaska. So by averaging those two, I can hit exactly my target, which is the employment level of Alaska. So that's the technical rationale for you know, combining different groups in order to, as close as possible, exactly match the characteristics. But of course, you could instead do kind of one at a time and see how the results look like by choosing kind of one control state at a time. Um, so. Actually, yes. My question. Sorry. <laughs> I know that it is the limitation of the existing data we have because there are only Alaska in the US who implement this. Right. So I was thinking if Massachusetts do indeed implement this universal basic income, like how, because how, Massachusetts is so different from Alaska in terms of all the industrial in composition and economy and uh, in education, etc. So potentially, it might have a different uh, effect on the employment. I was just thinking. like. It could, and that's something that we could study, but you'll have to wait for 30 yeah. years. Yeah. You know, especially if you want to have this <laughs> amount of you know, uh, uh, evidence for the, for the long run. But you know, I agree it would be very interesting. Yeah, at least it doesn't harm, so that's, you know. Yes, that's, first do not harm. Yeah. <laughs> so, yes. Thank you so much. This was a, an uh, incredible and really great um, presentation, yeah. um, and really great to learn about the work that you're up to. So, um, if we could thank, thank you all. Yeah.